go. Okay, Jay, today we're talking about chapter 14, Do Less Better. And right off the bat, you mentioned in the text that the reader should focus. So right now, the, the listener should focus too. And what we want to focus on in general, what you talk about in the text, is the essentials in life, your business, and your relationships. So can you talk a little bit more just to, as an intro of do less better and focusing on very specific things? I think in business, you and I were just talking actually before we hit record that there's always more and more ideas. And just because you have an idea doesn't mean you should implement it. But oftentimes just like, hey, let's run with it. I know I was guilty of that back in the day to the point where like you guys would be afraid to tell me ideas because you would know I'd be like, let's do it. And if you're trying to do too much, you're doing nothing well. And I think that's really where this chapter came from. We were just trying to do way too much, biting off more than we can chew, and then ultimately sacrificing what makes you successful and what you started this business for in the first place. Now, to put some perspective into this, like 2012, 2013, we had our office, and in that office, there was a giant whiteboard. And, and our desk was right there too. We'd have meetings every Tuesdays at 10 a.m. And that whiteboard would just be filled with all of the amazing ideas that came up over the weekend, like a new way to store the wall balls, uh, a new event we could run, uh, let's do this specialty class, things like that. And at one point, there was a guy, I don't remember his name, you probably do, where he came in to teach us about, I think it was checks and balances or like making a list of things that would kill an idea. Do you remember that? Yeah, I believe his name was Eric. Yep. And I, I believe he actually passed away a few years ago, young guy. But, that, um, yeah. but Eric, Eric was his name. Yeah, I remember he came in and one of the things he would always preach, but yeah, he had the, we had the whole idea killer seminar. Remember that? So it was all the coaches got Wait, together. Can, can, you, can you repeat yourself? You cut out there for a second. We, we had the idea killer seminar. Yeah, yeah. So all, all the coaches got together and we were like, he said, everyone comes up with an idea and then we're going to shoot them down and whichever one is left standing, we're going to go with. Yeah. And so we did that. And then one thing that he said that was, that really resonated with me was for an idea to, to work, it has to be meaningful or unique. So meaningful can be like an upgrade or unique can be like something that never existed before. But unless you're doing one of those two things, it's a dumb idea. Yeah. And, and he would in shooting it down and be like, okay, we want to start a 10 AM golden oldies class with only people 60 age and above. And the first thing he'd say, okay, well, who's going to coach it? And then who's going to put in the programming for that? How are we going to go out and get those people? And he would just keep piling on the list and list and list of things that would possibly work against that idea versus where we were just coming in of like, oh, let's just put on a schedule next week. It'll work and, and people will come. And he's like, all right, well, what about all this late, like, these 20 things that could possibly go wrong or not work for it? Or you have to remember this is going to be 52 weeks a year, 365 days, you know, like how does this all work with the grand scheme of the business and your own lives? Yeah. Or, you know, and, and if you're a box owner listening, it's like, Hey, that sounds like a great idea. We're going to have golden oldies. Well, okay. How much are you going to charge? How much are you going to pay your coach? How much does it cost to keep the lights on for that hour? It's like, you're actually losing money. And yeah. then for, for so many things, you know, that's really what we needed to do. But you got to give me a little bit of credit at this point. I used to, I used to bring in a lot of people for us. Yeah, it, we we would get all the new. It was, the great thing was we had so many people joining the gym, and everyone had such unique. Well, they still do, but they had so such unique backgrounds and experiences. And like this is what Eric used to do. This was his profession was uh, help going into businesses and helping them develop their strategies and plans and and with these little uh, kill lists on what we could, you know, what could shoot down an idea. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he would come in, we'd have, we have Sasha who led meetings. We had plenty of other people, you know, doctors and chiropractors and massage therapists. So I would always do my best to try to take 
the people that had unique jobs and, and we're passionate about them and see what we can do to implement them into the ecosphere. I was, I was always very proud of creating that kind of bubble within Albany CrossFit where people's businesses could thrive just amongst the members. You know, and Dr. B was a great example who was a chiropractor, you know, she had 50 members of her chiropractic business that were CrossFit members or a massage therapist that always try to push people to there, or even in this situation with Eric, you know, try to use him and, and, and show off his skills. Yeah. And I think it's uh that that's a really cool thing to do as a gym, you know, like, well, as a community, because CrossFit's more than just a gym is uh celebrate your members and what they're capable of. Cause you have 12 people in a class. Well, that's 12 very talented people with all these different skills. I mean, look at, he's probably listening right now, Josh, you know, he does audio work and he's doing the audio book. Everyone's listening to his sweet, tender voice and he's <laughs> going to edit this together. So like, he's a very talented individual that no one else in the gym could probably do what he does. So it's cool that people know about it. Yeah. I mean, that's just always been me. I always try to keep everybody in the circle. And I think when it goes to CrossFit, you know, the people that do CrossFit and, and show up every day are a unique breed. So they tend to be successful by themselves. So it's nice to always support them. Yeah. Now let's, let's go back in time to 2007 though, where the gym schedule was kind of morphed around your personal life and you were putting your focus into still teaching other classes outside of CrossFit and outside of Albany CrossFit. And it was taking away focus from Albany CrossFit. So the schedule is all over the place. Monday, you'd have a 5 a.m., uh, a noon, and a 3 p.m. Tuesday, you'd have uh, 8 a.m., a 4 p.m., and an 8.30 p.m. Like, it was all over the place based on where when you could come in. And everyone else had to adapt to that schedule. Can you talk about that time and how it affected the membership and the business? And yourself? Yeah, well, when, when, I, when I started the gym, like I've talked about, I had some other obligations. And, you know, I, the gym was in the core club. And most of my obligations were in the core club. So I was always around. But it was whether or not I can coach a set schedule. And I also was committed to some other classes where I was on, like, a semester basis for the town. So I couldn't just quit that. So the first three months or so, I know I've talked about going all in and, and I really did, you know, I put everything into it financially. I, you know, for the most part, got rid of all my clients, but I still had a handful of obligations that were kind of slowing down. But in the meantime, I still had them. And yeah, like you said, it wasn't like Monday through Friday, there's a 5 PM class. It might've been Monday's five, Tuesday's five thirty. Wednesday's 545 because it depended on when I was able to get there when I finished other classes and it, it was a struggle because I had to remember the schedule the the members had to remember the schedule and for the record that didn't last very long you know we opened in September and by by the end of that semester November December I had gotten rid of everything but CrossFit but for those first few months I, I wasn't sure you know that we'd fill up those classes yeah, and it, it doesn't sound very sustainable, you know, especially putting it on the members to remember, okay, is it is it 3.30 tomorrow or is it 3.45 or, or 3, you know, and not knowing when, when to show up. And you mentioned in the book that the big lesson that you learned was that if you had time to work, it should be on your business and not someone else's business. And I think that's a pretty profound and important lesson to learn uh, overall for a new entrepreneur who might still have their hand in other ventures. Yeah, and, and, and I've talked about this at other times, but we can use uh, you know, Dr. B as an example. You know, so Dr. B was, is my favorite chiropractor. She's amazing. She's in the Albany area. But word got to me that she kind of had some part-time gigs going on. You know, we don't have to talk about what they were, but, and they were nothing to do with her chiropractic business. And I, I said to Dr. B, I was like, hey, if, if you're going to work for four hours somewhere else, and making you know 50 60 even a hundred dollars that's the time you should be working on your business if you can't if you can't make that much money on your business in that time you need to get rid of this business and maybe it's not going to look like hey i'm here my 
you know, door is open, I'm making a hundred dollars. But if you can't think of ideas, if you can't be doing things that, you know, benefit your business in that time, then you should close your business down. And I felt the same way about CrossFit. I was going out teaching, you know, yoga classes, training people, coaching at other gyms. And, and even for the most part, that was for me directly, but I felt like this is time I should be dedicating to my new business and growing it. You need to do less and do less better. And Albany CrossFit needed to be the better and the other things need to be the less. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and even to the point of like this book, we're both very busy, but we've found the time every day to work on this. And for me, it's important. It's part of the business. It's part of, you know, growing something you've created. There's other ways you can spend this time, but it, it's just being smarter about your time. And when you own a business, it should be, your business is going to run you ragged to begin with. Why are you wasting energy elsewhere? It's like, it's like dating, right? If you find the right one, just settle down. Don't spend all this energy elsewhere. Just, just, just devote all of your good energy to one person. One person. So you solidify the ACF schedule. How did you, this is, this is tough. I see a lot of questions on coaching and affiliate forums about how do I know when to put a class on? How do I know when to take a class off? How do I expand my schedule, especially for brand new box opening up? Well, what time are you have in class and what time is best? How did you decide upon your first initial schedule? That I think that first seven days a week. Yeah, the first schedule was pretty much it was set as far as like the same days and times every day, but it was basically around my schedule. So we, you know, we and I also knew we kind of needed this morning time, we needed the evening time, and I figured out that middle of the day time. So what I always tell people nowadays is you can always add classes, but it's very hard to take away. And, and that's really accidentally what I did well because it was a one-man show. So I was the how, one. How do you know? How do I know no. which times are ideal? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, no, you, uh, you broke up there for a second. So it was based around my schedule. And, you know, I... I, I had to set it up around when I could coach, but also not to put too much on the calendar at once, meaning, you know, you, you could have a seven, eight, nine, and 10, or you can just figure out, okay, the, the people that drop off their kids can make the nine or the people that can't do that, make the seven. So I did my best knowing I was going to coach 100% of the classes that I didn't want to make myself crazy either. Yeah. And I I think that, what you said uh, a little earlier was very important. It's easy to add, but it's hard to take away because maybe you have all these awesome classes on the schedule. You have 13 classes a day, but very few people are coming spread out across the day to those classes. And it would be better to have 10 people at the five instead of five people at the five and five people at the six. So you have a bigger class. It's more economical for you as a coach, energy wise and time wise. And then it's hard, but then it's hard to say, Hey guys, the six o'clock is going away. You're right. You can always add another class, but it's hard to take a class away. Cause if one person goes to it, they're going to complain about it. But you know, and then the other thing was I'd been involved in fitness for a long time. I kind of knew the, I knew the routine, you know, there's the morning crowd, there's the crowd that's, you know, the 9am crowd that comes in after there's the noon class and then there's the evening class. So I had a rough idea of what I wanted to do but it was also just about not putting too much on there. And, and even back then, the evening classes were, I believe we just had two. And this is, so you had the background of teaching group exercise. Was this anything that CrossFit themselves gave advice on? They're like, hey, classes should be an hour in length. Uh, you should have, you know, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. You know, like, how did they, how did they help with this, if at all? I don't remember any direct help. I think, you know, it was CrossFit was still new. So coach Glassman, wasn't that far removed from doing this himself. So there was probably a handful of journal articles about it, but I think it was kind of just the group class mentality. And, and for the most part, that meant an hour class and the typical, you know, morning, noon and evening routine for most people, but it wasn't, um, there wasn't a, a to do 
or a, or a, a here's how you do it list. So you have a class on the schedule and only one person for weeks on end comes to that class. It's Bob. We'll say it's Bob. That's his name. Uh, how do you know it is indeed time to stop offering that class? And then how do you have that conversation with Bob? It's the only time he can come too. Yeah, you know, honestly, I can't remember that ever really happening at the gym in a good way. And I think part of that was just being smart in advance of, of what classes we were offering. But if I were going to have that, I mean, that goes right back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, hey, you might think this is a great idea. Bob pays $200 a month and he comes to the 3 p.m. class, which is offered every day. And he's the only one that comes. All right, well, his $200, you're paying your coach 20 so that means you're paying your coach, you know, four hundred dollars a month. Bob's paying two hundred. You, therefore, you're losing two hundred dollars. You're, you know, you're losing two hundred dollars, and maybe that coach that's coaching that class has to coach other classes. They would probably do a better job coaching their additional classes with more people, having this break at three. Yeah, that one person, two person, even like a three person class is an energy drain a lot of the times. Like I'd rather coach 20 than three. Yeah. And it's awkward for the person sometimes, you know, like you, you, you try to make it fun, but CrossFit is fun when you're working out with other people. Yeah. I mean, you know, and they'll joke around, Oh, I get a one-on-one -on -one session today, which is great if it happens sporadically, but not when it's happening every day. So you gotta, you know, and, and even if you look at it like, Hey, once in a while, someone else does show up. Like you said, there's a lot more to it than just the cost of the class. There's the energy of the coach. There's, you know, are you turning the lights on at the gym at that time where normally you wouldn't have to? Could you be doing something else better with your time if you're the owner? You know, is that time better served on your own training? Is that time better served, you know, spending time with your family? So there's lots of other options out there. But you got to sit Bob down and say, hey, Bob, we love you here. But you're the only one coming and most likely this person's not dumb. Like they'll get it. Hey, Bob, and you know, you're, you're the only one showing up for weeks on end. I'm going to need, we're going to need to move this class. Hopefully you can make a different time. Yeah. Just have that conversation with them. And, you know, you also have to realize that Bob may decide, okay, well, I, I need to find another gym. This is the only time I can work out, you know, um, I don't know if there's any other other recourse about it. You know, you, you you let Bob go, but that time is more valuable in the long run without that class. Uh, or maybe you try to convert Bob to personal training. Maybe, but then, you know, then you have to have a conversation with him. Like, okay, personal training is typically more expensive than the group classes. Yeah, and I mean, really, what you should have done is your homework prior to this. You You should have, this should not be happening if you're doing if you're running a successful box. You would have known better to put a class on that only one person could show up for. So obviously this is a hypothetical scenario. You know, maybe the gym is slowing down for whatever reason. But yeah, you have to be smart about it. But but ultimately it comes down to be smart about what time you're putting those classes on. Do less better. <laughs> Do less better. Keep saying there, it. There there's the first the first lesson there on, you know, we'll just Focusing on, you know, if you have time, that time should be spent on your business. And then within that business, you have to realize that there's, there's time sucks and there's ways that you could be doing less within your own business to make that business better. And that's kind of the first little part that you discussed in the text was just with the schedule. And it seems like something is so small, but really, if you have 11 classes on the schedule, that's 11 hours a day that you're, you're working. You're working more than than the average person week in and week out. And you know, and there, even to this day in 2020, there are plenty of boxes where they have just the owner coaching most of the classes or maybe one other coach. We were lucky in that, you know, most days the coaches only coach two, maybe three classes. But, but yeah, if you're the only coach on there and you're putting on six, seven, eight, ten 10 classes a day, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, you might feel good about it day one, and then day two, it slowly starts to eat away at you. Well, and it's the whole method and, and reason we started a CrossFit, right? I had 20 clients, and I realized I can work 20 hours or I can work one. Well, it's the same principle here. Why am I trying to make concessions for every single person's schedule?
you know, when, when I moved here to Boulder, for example, I grab a schedule. I'm like, okay, let's see what fits. I'm not, you know, I'm available at two in the afternoon most days. There's no class at two in the afternoon in most CrossFits, right? So you, you kind of have, so I make an accommodation. All right, I'll go in the morning. I'll get up early or I'll, you know, change my schedule so I can hit the four. People can make it happen. Yeah, you just have to, to you, you just have to essentially set the schedule too. Like if it's almost the, uh, if you build it, they will come. Just like, just lay it down. This is what it is. This is what we do here. And then they'll come. And the people who can't, they unfortunately won't. Exactly. Now, the, the next topic that you discuss in this do more or do less better chapter is specialty classes. Because this is where things could definitely get out of control within an affiliate. You want to have your gymnastics class. You want to have your barbell club. You want to have a strongman course. You want to have a, a, a group of people that meets three times a week to go running miles on end mobility but, class yeah mobility class which never never works like i like <laughs> which i i think the mobility class is the one thing albany crossfit that was tried the most frequently by multiple coaches and it literally never worked and i'll just say right now think about the what the response from your members when they're like oh i gotta, I gotta go I, I can't i can't stretch right now you're like all right are you gonna do it at home and they're like yeah, yeah yeah i'll do it at home no they won't and they don't like it and they don't care um that's the hardest thing is that mobility class i think you're right that was the class we tried so many times and it just it it was the same thing and i talk about it in the book it's like week one everyone's here we're mobilizing this is gonna be great we're gonna be so flexible we're gonna have the best squat week two a handful of people are like we're back that was great week three one person's there and week four no one is showing up and that's basically how most specialty classes run I, I remember we did mobility classes with Caleb. Uh, Dean and Kevin probably taught mobility classes. I taught mobility classes. We would bring in outside people. So look, it's like, it's not even our coaches. It's this outside expert that's going to lead it once a month. We had Cardin doing melt. Remember the melt oh, method? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was always... We had, uh, 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 people doing yoga. It, it went through so much of... It was, it was always like... I can see like the, the, in your eyes, like every time a new coach would take over, they're like, watch me, I'm going to be the guy. This yeah. is the time it's going to work. I remember, because that's how Kevin Houston was, right? Kevin would always be like, don't worry. I'm the best. I got this. Hold my beer. <laughs> I'll get this mobility <laughs> class to work. <laughs> and then <laughs> Crashed and burned two weeks yeah. later. And, and it would happen time and time again with specialty classes. Yeah. And so it's, how, how do you know when a specialty class might be a right fit for your gym? Because there are some that, that do work. I see a lot of affiliates have a weightlifting class or a barbell club. We at Albany CrossFit now have had a barbell club since 2014, a very successful one. Uh, but we've also had straw man classes that we canceled after time. You know, we had the endurance clubs, gymnastics clubs. How do you know when it's the right fit for your community? You know, that's one of those questions that even to this day, I would say, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. I've learned some lessons and I would tell you it's probably rarely the right fit. And you have to have a really big membership base to make it work. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a big part of it. Like how big is your membership base? And then also, you know, are you doing these specialty classes in lieu of or in addition to regular classes? So, you know, years later, I've, I've seen boxes that do it well. Like they'll have a kettlebell class and they'll have a dumbbells only class. And like you've talked about a barbell club. But I think if you're going to do it right, the foundation is CrossFit. You know, so you're either doing, you're either doing these classes in a way that it's a supplement to your foundation or you're drawing in a whole new demographic of people simply for that class. Yeah. And I think you'll find with something like a, like a barbell club or a weightlifting class, you're going to get those people who they join, they join CrossFit and then they're like, Oh man, I really don't like CrossFit, but I do love that barbell lifting part. I do want to get stronger. And then that's a way to keep them and it keeps them engaged. You know, like a, a, we, we like to think that CrossFit is for everyone because it is, 
but not everyone wants to do it. Like they just don't want to do the Metcons, don't want to do the burpees. They have different goals. So if you have something else that can cater to those goals, then they'll stay at your gym and they'll stay a part of your community. So I'd say that's probably part one. And then part two is I would say you definitely have to charge for it. And this is where I think we made mistakes in the past where we used to offer so many specialty classes for free. And then that's when we would find we'd have on week one, 30 people in the gymnastics class. And then it would start to dwindle off because they had no skin in the game. They weren't paying for it. So they're like, okay, well, gymnastics class next door with Caleb will always be there now. It's part of the schedule. But today I want to do this Metcon. And I, I need more cardio. I want to do this. All right. I do want pull-ups, but I want to get my sweat on today. So it's like, you know, like, but if you're paying for it, you're going to be more likely to come. And that's where we found success with our barbell club it started off as just a free class just a weightlifting class we got together once a week i taught things and we worked on that unit and then it turned into after that when it got popular hey we're offering another class it's going to be a separate membership who wants in and it, it just worked well and i think something else that works well is when you have a barbell class for example it's very clear and obvious the progression the and the the gains that your athletes are making you know, versus mobility or gymnastics sometimes is, you know, we're, we're working on skills or we're working on improving your movement or your mechanics, but it's not measurable. It's not as measurable, I should say. Yeah. Right? Or so it, it doesn't, you don't adapt as quickly. Like after yeah. a squat cycle, you can be like, look, you got stronger and you post a video and everyone's happy. But after four weeks of foam rolling, you still can't touch your toes. And it's like, yeah. all right, what are we doing here? And, you, and you, it's not really things that you're going to take a video on and, hype up the same way right so you know maybe someone gets their first pull-up but at the same time so much other stuff goes into that like how are you eating are you losing weight all of those things are important when it comes to that where like you said in in a, in a barbell class you pr your back squat by 30 pounds two months later you, you have something really tangible there so i think that's a big part of it and i would also you know th so throw in there Maybe it doesn't become a set part of your schedule, but it becomes a specialty class as far as you offer it once in a while. You know, it's a, it's a monthly thing or it's even less than that quarterly. And then you have people showing up in droves for it. Yeah, uh, we did that. If you remember with the, uh, our West Side powerlifting program, where it'd be like, hey, it's, it's an eight week course. It costs this much after the course, you know, we're done for a while. It would almost be like semesters. We'd offer it in the fall, offer it in the spring, offer it in the winter and the summer. So that's another good way to do it. Yeah, having small courses like that. I think when we say the specialty classes that we had on, it was that it was just like, all right, gymnastics classes. I mean, I remember there was that point where every day on the schedule we had a different specialty class. Yep. And it and and I purposely did that. Like I really pushed for it. I really wanted it. And then you realize again. It's taking time out. And, you know, for Albany CrossFit, for example, it caused some tension. We had the big space where, where the wads went down and we had our like auxiliary second space where the specialty classes were, but then all of a sudden we had to kick people out of that room. So it's like, we're causing other, again, going back to the, you know, the kill list, right? Well, yep. you're, you're pissing off other members. At one point, let's see, let's name them all. So people can get perspective. This is this is at the same time period. The same time period we had our regular CrossFit classes, about 11 to 12 classes a day. I think at our peak, I want to say, let me see, we had a 545. Yep. I, wouldn't, I know we had a 7. Yep. I'm almost positive we had an 8, 9, and maybe even a 10. Mm, the 10 didn't last long. But we did have it for a bit, right? For a little bit. Okay, so that's 5, but by 10 a.m., then we had a noon, and then I think we went to the evening, 3.30, 4.30, 5.30, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, 12 classes. Yep. So that's, 12, that's just wads. That's just regular wads, 12 classes a day. Uh, depending on the time of the week or the, the, the day, uh, we had two on-ramps, morning on-ramp, evening on-ramp. So that's like Tuesday and Thursdays. There's one at 7 a.m., one at 7 p.m. All right. So and that's, that, and that, that was a month-long month -long on-ramp. Six more classes, though, basically on the calendar. Yep. Then we would have, it would change day to day, like you said. Every day we had a different specialty thing. We had weightlifting. We had strongman. 
We had kettlebells. We had gymnastics. We had mobility. We had rowing slash endurance. And I think that might be it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we had every, I, I forgot that we had like a kettlebell class with Viv every Tuesday. I yep. know strongman was Wednesdays. And I think we had a second strongman class on Saturdays. Yep, we did. You're right. And then I think, yeah, Thursdays, Thursdays might have been the, the the mobility. I think we did that because Thursdays was typically the slowest class of the week. So we tried to offer something that people would come in for. Yep. Wow. We were dumb. So, and that's, uh, that's with a staff of six people. And it, it sounds like, like that's not too much for a staff of six to cover, but we're also doing all the backside business stuff, meeting with on-ramps one-on-one, doing tours, uh, you know, people coming in, wanting to know about CrossFit, responding to emails, uh, planning events, which we're going to get into here shortly, like parties and competitions. So that's, uh, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, we had some, you know, part-timers, but yeah, for the most part, it was, you know, the six of us doing everything too much. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say those part-timers, I, I don't know if they're listening or they know who they are, but I, I know for a fact they, they didn't do anything. <laughs> they, <laughs> like, like they, they might have coached, coached a class here and there, but, the, but that still didn't really lighten the load. It's like, it's yeah. no different with you here or with you not here. And for some of them, it was like them coaching actually gave us more work to do. Yeah, cool. okay. well, then that's another thing too. Um, Ma- managing the whole staff and the development of coaches as well, which we, oh, we had a, full... a lot of, a lot of that. We used to meet regularly to practice coaching level one yeah. style, level two style. Yeah. I mean, we had a full coaches development program. Like you said, every Tuesday we had meetings. So as you can tell, our schedule was very, very jam packed. Oh yeah. Th- those were 70 to 80 hour weeks. Yes. I used to log, I used to log it. So as not the business owner, I know I used to Murph used to Kevin, we used to work 70 to 80 hour weeks as a, uh, as co-entrepreneurs of Albany CrossFit. Yeah. I'm surprised we're, you know, we're all still alive talking about it. Yeah. And that, so that's a massive undertaking for five to six people to manage a 500 person membership, two affiliates and all, all that that goes into it. And so we were doing more is better instead of uh, do less better. Yeah, we were doing more is better, and it was not a better product, though. Yeah, it it, it makes you think, like, what could could we have improved upon had we cut out some of those specialty classes, if we cut back on the schedule a little bit, and definitely, as we're going to talk about here in a second, the parties and all the little special events. So on top of everything I just listed, we were doing a party once a month at a minimum. That was my goal. Like... Everything we're talking about, keep in mind, I pushed for it. Like, I wanted. I wanted that busy schedule. I wanted a specialty class every day, and I wanted a party every month. So, yeah, I was, make, you know, I was at the forefront of this making these mistakes. But, yeah, it was, you know, we, in my mind, I was just like, the more we could do, the better we're going to be, the bigger we're going to grow. And it was completely backwards. Yeah, I, I highly doubt there are any gyms right now that are, running the same type of operation. I, 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 maybe there were others back in the day, but I, I kind of feel like we were like a little bit of a unique Island. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I think, you know, especially back in this time period, there weren't as many boxes and there certainly weren't as many successful boxes. It's hard when you're at the top meaning we were probably one of the biggest boxes in the world, as far as membership, as far as size, as far as how long we had been around, you start to get arrogant and just think you know everything. Like, hey, what we're doing is working, so more is better. What we're doing is working, so we must be right. But we had no one to really look at and say, well, that's a better idea. Yeah. And it was hard for you guys to dispute me because here we were being successful. And, and if you think about it, too, you know, it – it certainly, I don't know how much longer that could have gone on in the long term without everyone just completely breaking. But it's also, we were at many times, even with a 12 class a day schedule and all those specialty classes, doing more other uh, projects than actually coaching. And there's also that less time available, even though we're all working 80 hours a week, there's less time for you as the business owner to be like, all right, I'm going to take Murph out for a coffee and see how he's doing. Murph's too busy to go out for coffee. 
even with the boss and you're too busy to sit down for coffee. So it's like, we started all like, um, we started to do less and less team bonding, if that made sense. And then that's when tempers would flare. There'd be uh, breakdowns and arguments in the, at our Tuesday meetings at 10. Well, I mean, really, when you look at it, the only time we then had available for all the head coaches was one to three. Yeah. That was it. Right. Because outside of that, one of us was probably coaching or we were busy with, with the box one to three every day was kind of our break time where the, the evening people kind of were, were coming in the morning people had were wrapping up, but it was hard to get everybody together at that point because there was always something going on. And, and even though that was our time, there were no classes. Like you said, we probably had something to do. And yeah, that was, that was, it was certainly draining as far as energy, but also, yeah, feeling like, you know, this camaraderie that we had was, was slowly dwindling away. We were drifting apart. And we were spread out between uh, two boxes too, because we had crossed with Clifton Park. Yeah, we, you know, so that's true. Somebody was already 30 minutes away. Yeah. And I think that we would typically make Caleb drive down to Albany. Uh, whatever no, we would do. It was, it was Murph. Oh, Murph. Murph, Murph had to yeah. drive down to yeah, Albany. Murph, Murph was the one who had to drive down to Albany and would get yelled at if he was late because he had to drive <laughs> 30 minutes from freaking Clifton Park and there's traffic, you know? So it's like the, uh, it was a rough time for all. <laughs> uh. But the, you know, going back to the parties it, and what I noticed was, Hey, these parties were so much fun. Let's do more. And then as we started to offer more, like 12 people would be showing up where originally these parties were crazy you know they'd be they would literally run till two three four in the morning everybody's getting drunk you know having a good time working out all all sorts of fun you know we talked about the the halloween party so you get the the spoonful of cinnamon the challenges and then all of a sudden they just became too much kind of like we talked about with specialty classes they just were less important and we, we, that was something we realized and we just kind of turned that ship around. And we, we turned it around with just one big party, the, the winter formal. The, the winter formal oh, was my, the, the winter formal was my best invention, if you will. That was, my <laughs> favorite. That, was that was my favorite thing that we did at Albany CrossFit. So yeah, you're right. We went from having all these parties, and then I think this was probably a collaboration of everybody. We talked about it. And we we're like, let's just have one huge formal. And I think we did have a couple other things. We still had like the Hope um, fundraisers. Yeah, Memorial so, Day, you know, barbecues, things like that. But not like so, a full on, you know, music's up, drinks are out party uh, every month. Yeah, this was basically the, the annual prom, if you will, of CrossFit. We did it wintertime. Um, we rented the hotel as far as, you know, the, the, the ballroom area, we had, you know, an open bar, we had food served. Um, we had speeches, we did, a, you know, annual awards. We only actually wound up doing two because then I wound up selling the gym, but it was, they were a great two parties and those, you know, although it was one, it took a lot of time to set up, but it was less time than it took for each individual party. Yeah. It, a, a lot of work goes into a big party like that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a good time to, you know, like, I think every box should have a way to celebrate their members. Like we were talking about earlier, celebrate their talents on what they do, maybe have a member of the month, but also at the end of the year, like, Hey, who's the the athlete of the year? Who's, who's done uh, the most PRs, things like that. And then celebrate your coaches too, which we had coaching awards. I think uh, Murph, Viv, Pat, Brett, maybe, maybe not Brett were inducted into the Hall of Fame? I think Brett was. I don't, you know, I don't think Brett made it to the party, but I think he would have been inducted had he made it. I think that was it. And I probably got mad at him for not coming, so I didn't allow him to get inducted. <laughs> oh, you know you know what? I Actually, I think the reason I'm thinking of Brett is because we told everyone it was going to be Brett, but it was really Murph. Because that was the only way to have Murph off of the scent because he's the one ordering the, the awards and everything. So, so we said, we said, oh, Brett's going to be inducted, but really it was Murph. Oh, that was a the surprise, Murph. The surprise, but yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that was one of the coolest things. We did the Hall of Fame. And like you said, the Hall of Fame was pretty much all 
all at that time members that became coaches in like yeah. all the people that you mentioned and and maybe a handful of other people made it but we did like you said rookie of the year member of the year um i think Both we did male and female yeah it, it, and every coach kind of presented it was like you know like an award show where a different coach would present each award yeah that those are definitely cool and you can get those awards you know for a good price at like crown awards and just do something or make them you know out of broken piece of equipment i see people do that spray That's paint cool. some broken plates and stuff yeah and, no uh, we did some like serious award i mean they were like 25 no more than that they were probably like 50 bucks a, a pop for some of these it was, like, it was like the oscars yeah it was a big deal and then the members got to make a nice little speech and everything and and we did our best oh you know what else we did some of it was voting yeah so you would get there and you would be able to vote for the member of the year the rookie of the year right so yep. a couple that, of awards like, I, rem I remember trying to eat dinner and calculate the votes at the same time <laughs> <laughs> I, the, I remember yeah i remember trying trying to do that at the at the same time and uh and uh you were harassing me while i was trying to to do that <laughs> was i getting mad that it wasn't done fast enough yeah you were getting like, like you're getting mad on top of all the other things i was trying to do and i think joanna attacked you she came at you and then you're like, oh, I didn't realize Joanna had a bite like that. I'm going to go away now. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, who never yells, yelled at me. Yeah, I yeah. can see that. Yeah, uh, so, but I remember, so the Hall of Fame was something that we all decided on as the coaching staff. But then these other awards, there were nominees. So leading up to the, to the party, we would put videos on the, on the website, pictures on the website, announcing the nominees. Like, it was a really big deal. It was, it was very fun. I think some people campaigned as well. Like I want to yeah. say like, like Clark or someone like made their own video on like why they should be no nominated as member, I, or I member agree. Rookie of the year. I remember. Yeah. And yeah, it was, a, it was a really good time. I'm going to find some of those pictures. I know I had made some images of like, I remember Renee won rookie of the year or Murph got his hall of fame. And then other things that we did at the party was, you know, we had a professional photographer with the screen and the props so people could take pictures, um, you know, and, and take them home. We had, you know, all sorts of props and prizes that people can take with them. It was a real, it was, it was basically a problem. It was, it was so much fun. So do less better, less parties, less classes, potentially uh, choose your specialty courses wisely and try to focus your time and your energy on your business or even your fitness or your coaching as a part you know as opposed to, to something that's not going to directly benefit those things uh, any any closing advice for the the affiliate owner on do less better no but as we're doing this i just realized like think about it the the prom if you will if we'll call it like the prom how much fun and how much we remember from it and look back on it with like fond memories where I bet you, like, I can remember a handful of the parties we had, but I can't remember most of them. Yeah. Right? I, so, I remember just the, the, uh, a few talent shows and, and uh, the formals. Yeah. I mean, and, and if you think about those, those, I think we had two big talent shows and we had two big formals. So when you think about it, you know, the, those were things that we spent a lot of time, effort and energy on, and they wound up being really successful where when you're doing too much, you know, the whole principle is do less, but do it better, which is exactly what we did there. And then prior to that, we're trying to do too much, you know, and, and same holds true with the classes. You know, we can kind of sit back and say, hey, remember we had all these specialty classes versus the one that you spent a lot of time on. And now you have this amazing community of people that lift or, you know, the barbell club is, is super successful because you put so much good energy into it. So that's really the, what I learned from this is, in, in big picture, you know, with if you're a boxer or your coach, just any human being, you only have so much time and so much energy you can devote to these things. And if you're trying to put it to too much, it's not going to work. And it's it's hard when you're in the middle of it to think big picture. Like it's you just focus on the now. Like well, having five additional classes right now seems like a really good idea, but maybe you have to take time to reflect on the big picture too. Yeah, I would say. Get yourself someone like Eric who will help you kind of just just hammer that question it over and over. You know, 
I don't know that we have a specific drill for it. I know he did, and I can look into it. I'll see if I can find it for everybody. But, you know, it was it was really a, a checklist on how you go about figuring out if something's good. But at a minimum, make sure it's meaningful or unique. You know, meaningful being, you know, I'm making this better. You know, you, you take the toothbrush, like, there's not much you can do to make it better. Well, we can make it electric. You know, now now it's better. Versus, you know, unique. Well, we need to create something new. We have a new way of doing something. So think of those two things, but then make sure you really dive deep. Is it going to be worth it from a time effort and energy and financial perspective? Is that going to work for you? And, and I think that's really the challenge. Find something in your life that you can get rid of that actually makes the rest of your life easier and better. Yeah. I think that's a, gr- I think that's a great drill for everybody to practice. Every day we do something that we don't necessarily want to do, like to do, but we force ourselves to do it. And I think if we, you know, and it might not be a daily task, it might just be one thing, but if, if by saying no to something, you, you could free up time for the things you really want to do, it, it just makes everything easier. Yeah. Like if you're a coach and you have to coach one kid's class every Saturday and you're dreading every Saturday coming forward and you're like, I'm just really not into it, not enjoying it. I feel like my time would be better served elsewhere. Then maybe that's the thing, you know, just as an example. Yeah. Cause you know, we often equate things to like, Hey, well, but that's $20 in my pocket, you know, for coaching. Well, if you didn't coach that class, would you have made that $20 elsewhere or is having you know, cause it's not just an hour. It's like, okay, I had to get up. Yeah. I had to go to the gym. I had to, you know, do you have all to this. drive there. Right. So is, I think so many times we're like, oh, I'm going to make 20 bucks, but it's not an hour. It's three hours, you know? So are you better off doing something you enjoy? Would that make your, will you do better at work the rest of the week and maybe get a raise? You know, there's so many ways to look at it. Yeah. Like that three hours for that kid's class could be spent, you know, reading a, a, a journal article or writing one even, and you know, you know, and circling back to the beginning of this talk, this chapter, that's really, you know, what I had to, to do, you know, the box opened in September and I had a handful of classes. I had yoga classes. I was teaching for the town of Bethlehem. Like I was talking about, I had a handful of spin classes and a couple clients left and you realize, all right, if I, that's, you know, in my mind, I was like, okay, pile that all together. And it's maybe a few hundred dollars a, a week. I need that, but that's when I realized, well, if I just work on the gym and get one new member, that more than pays for it. And that's really, yeah. that's my point. It's not so much that you have to be working that time, but it's like, what can I be doing that time? Well, maybe it's make a new video. Maybe it's, you know, just walk around a parking lot and put flyers on a car. You know, maybe it's make cold calls to people. Maybe it's, you know, your box is big and it's coaches development. So now your classes are better. But that's how you have to look at it. It's not about the money you're taking in in that moment. It's about what you could be taking in if you were more productive with that time. Yeah, you put 20 flyers out on 20 cars, you get one person to come into the gym and sign up for a year or stay for a year. That's huge. And, and that's, that was really the eye-opening moment. It was like I wasn't at the gym and people would come in and I wouldn't get them to join. And I was like, wait, if I were there, even just sitting there doing nothing, I could have signed this person up. Yeah. And, and for sitting there doing nothing, that means I didn't have to expend energy teaching. I didn't have to drive somewhere else. And I could be doing, you know, work on the computer. Even I could just be reading, you know, a, a book on fitness, you know, a journal article. That's what it's all about. Yeah, just spending time being a better coach will have more value on everything. That's right. Do less better. Do less better. And it's out of not out of all the chapters, but really out of out of the thirty chapters and the thirty lessons. This is really one of the lessons I try to focus on every day because it's hard. It's like it's just innate in us, like. I want to do more. More is better. You got to hustle. You got to grind. Like you see all these entrepreneurs and the Gary V's out there telling you, you know, the Jockos to get up at four 30 and, you know, do this and do that. And it's like, Hey, you got to work hard, but at the same time, you got to be smart about it. Definitely. Well, just to recap the homework, figure out uh, if something is unique or if what you're doing is going to make something better and then try to find that one thing that you could maybe remove from your schedule or your life that would make everything else a little bit better. Absolutely. I think if people are able to do that, it'll be very, very 
uh, eye-opening for them. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jay. Another chapter down, chapter 15 tomorrow. Thanks again for listening to that special episode of Best Hour of Their Day. If you enjoyed, go ahead and download the book. You can check out the audio book. You can check out the paperback or even the ebook. We place the link right in the show description. So once again, thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day.